Hi, my name is Lydia and welcome to my channel and thank you for clicking on this video. If you are interested in true crime like I am, I invite you to click subscribe and come back for more stories of true crime. I will be talking about the crimes of serial killer Wayne Nance in Missoula, Montana during the years from 1974 through 1986. If you haven't heard about these crimes, there is a surprise ending, so stay tuned until the end. My sources for this true crime are linked in the description box below. The content warnings are that this case involves the intimate assault of women and a brief mention of animal torture. In my recounting of this true crime, I mean no disrespect to any of the people who are mentioned, and it is my intent to relay this information for educational purposes and to give a voice to the voiceless. Have you ever considered who you let into your home without thinking about it? A repair person? A plumber? What about a furniture delivery person? In Missoula, Montana, a man named Wayne Nance would be discovered as the type of delivery person you would not want delivering your new living room couch set. You wouldn't have wanted him anywhere near you at all. On October 8, 1955, Wayne Nathan Nance was born to parents George and Charlene. He was the second child in the family and also the first son. Two more children would follow, making the Nances a family of six. George and Charlene Nance married in 1952. George was 24 and Charlene was just 16. George's profession was a truck driver and Charlene was a hardworking waitress. When their children arrived, they were living in a trailer park, doing the best that they could to get by and to raise their children. Wayne stood out with his appearance, with curly red hair, pale skin, and intelligent steely eyes. He stayed a local boy and never lived anywhere except in Missoula, apart from his time in the Navy for three years. In school, Wayne was recognized as intelligent, getting good grades and classes. He was large and strong and he wrestled on the JV team although he wasn't interested in team sports like football. He was always a loner. Wayne did, however, enjoy drawing, and his classmates and his teachers would remark on his great skill. However, the art itself that Wayne drew was violent and dark, including monsters and weapons and graphic bloody scenes. And that wasn't the only thing that was troubling about Wayne as a kid growing up in Missoula. Wayne had a mean streak. In one incident when Wayne was young, this was witnessed and recounted many years later, Wayne had come across a box of kittens who were keeping themselves warm on a shelf under a burning incinerator on the property of the trailer park in which Wayne and his family lived. Wayne had stopped to look at the kittens, warming themselves all snug in the box, and then he had promptly opened the door to the incinerator and slid the box in. Other classmates had heard Wayne tell stories about how he had strung up cats on a clothesline and even skinned them alive. They were never sure if Wayne was telling the truth. They did know that Wayne was obsessed with knives. He carried one to school. He collected them at home. Wayne was just odd, his classmates would say. Wayne didn't have an easy time at home, however. When Wayne was 13, his father committed armed robbery of a grocery store, tying up and beating the manager before leaving with cash. He was caught right away, however, and sentenced to five years in prison. However, he only served one. And later, when Wayne was 24 and still living with his parents, his mother Charlene would have a blowout fight with his father George, driving off in a rage. Charlene would die later that night in a car accident, having driven her car head on into a tree. Her death 
was determined to be intentional. Wayne's serious problem started when he was 18 and a senior in high school. Things took a very serious, very dark turn when he started boasting that he was going to kill someone before he turned 19. In April 1974, housewife Donna Pounds was getting ready for the Easter holiday. It was Monday, Thursday, the day before Good Friday. The Christian holiday was important in the Pounds household because Donna's husband Harvey was a preacher. In fact, the whole family, Donna, Harvey, and their three children, were in the process of moving to another town so Harvey could start a new job at another church. Their current house was up for sale and their door was frequently left unlocked for the realtor's access. On that Thursday, Monday Thursday, Donna arrived home alone to an empty house, but it wasn't empty. A killer was waiting inside. When Donna entered her bedroom, she found a man waiting with a gun, a gun which was owned by her husband, Harvey, which had been kept in a hidden place, a built-in drawer in the couple's bedroom. The killer wore gloves and motioned for Donna to lie on the bed, which had been prepared with ropes tied to each of the bedposts. Donna was then sexually assaulted. Then she was led to the basement of the house where she was forced to kneel with her hands and her feet restrained and her mouth taped shut. She was shot five times in the back of the head at point blank range. And then as she slumped on the floor, the killer inserted the gun into her vagina where it remained. And then he left. The police at first suspected Donna's husband Harvey as the killer, but that theory didn't pan out. It didn't make sense though that the killer had used a gun kept in a location only known by the family. But there was someone else who knew about the gun, Wayne Nance. Wayne was friends with Donna's son, Kenny, and they had even taken out the gun once just to mess around and shoot it. And there was other circumstantial evidence against Wayne. A blood-stained glove was found discarded in the dirt about a half mile away but leading in the direction of the trailer part in which Wayne lived. A witness also reported seeing Wayne in the family's backyard that day. And another witness reported seeing a man walk away from the house carrying a black duffel bag. Wayne's classmates also contacted the police to say that Wayne had loosely admitted to the murder in school. In addition, he had not attended school that day. When the police came to Wayne's house with a search warrant, they found a black bag. The bag contained 22 caliber bullets and shell casings, the same brand used in the murder weapon. The police also found freshly washed underwear with a blood stain. Things didn't look good for Wayne Nance. However, it was not enough. Wayne was unruffled. He admitted to nothing. He was smart and he managed to beat the polygraph test. And then the police had to move on to other theories, such as a possible satanic cult connection. And within two months, Wayne left to join the Navy. He was still 18. Wayne Nance left the Navy after three years, returning home in 1977. He tried taking college classes at the University of Montana for a year or two, but College life just didn't stick. So he got to work. Wayne worked part-time as a bouncer at a rough and tumble cowboy bar named The Cabin. Eventually, he landed a full-time day job as well, working in the warehouse and as a delivery driver for local Missoula furniture store, Conlin's. It was there at Conlin's furniture store that Wayne would find the perfect hunting ground. But first, Wayne would find a victim at his other job, working as a bouncer at the local cowboy bar. It was there where he met a female drifter named Robin, 
a pretty girl with dyed red hair who would later be determined to be 16 years old at the time. She was a hitchhiker who landed at the bar one night with no money and no place to go. Wayne had offered to take in the girl who was in a desperate situation. The month was August 1984, and Wayne still lived at home with his father at the age of 29. Robin stayed with the two of them, Wayne and his father, for several weeks until the end of September 1984, when she was never seen again. Wayne had told his friends that Robin just simply left on a bus, but in actuality, Robin never left the area. She was found buried in a shallow grave, shot twice in the head, three months later, and three miles from Wayne's home. In his life, Wayne would never be a suspect in Robin's death. Investigators didn't even know her true identity until 22 years later in 2006. Robin was actually not her name. She was a runaway from Washington State, and her name was Marcy Bachman. Her brother had never stopped searching for her. And in 2006, he got his answer about what happened to Marcy, all through DNA. Wayne was later linked to this crime by a hair that was found in his truck. It was dyed the same exact red color as Robin's hair. And photos of Robin and Wayne were ultimately found in Wayne's bedroom. During the time that Robin was living with Wayne, he also was working full-time at Conlon's Furniture Store in Missoula. Conlon's was a large popular store which employed a large number of people. It is a chain furniture store that's still in operation along with several other locations in the Montana and Wyoming area of the country. Wayne was a hard worker in the warehouse at Conlon's and his job was backbreaking work. He clocked in early and he worked through his lunch breaks and he was punctual with his furniture deliveries and always ready to put in extra work. And it was because of his work ethic that his co-workers put up with the other side of Wayne. Wayne was often in a foul mood, snapping at fellow workers in the warehouse. He drew strange pictures on the warehouse walls and on the furniture boxes. And he kept nude women pinup pictures in his workstation, along with posters of Conan the Barbarian and Rambo. And Wayne was obsessed with the saleswomen who worked at Conlon's. At first, he seemed harmless, showering them with over-the-top flattery, bringing in flowers and trinkets and cards for all the women's birthdays and anniversaries, and offering to help them move their own furniture in their own homes. But the atmosphere became creepy when Wayne started taking Polaroid snapshots of the women he worked with, catching them off guard and stashing away the photos. He also made a peephole looking into the women's bathroom, and he even climbed into the ceiling to look down on the women in the bathroom as well. Wayne's creepy behavior didn't stop with the women at work, however. Women who had furniture delivered would report that they would receive obscene phone calls in the weeks following the delivery. Some had felt watched, and some were even victims of attempted attack. In 1980, a woman had reported that she had come home to find ropes tied to the bedposts of her bed, but no one else was there. The ropes had been tied just as they had been with housewife Donna Pounds. In 1983, a customer was ambushed by an intruder in her home, but he fled when her husband came home shortly afterward. A detailed hand-drawn floor plan of her apartment was later found among Wayne Nance's things. And then in 1985 came the shocking deaths of Michael and Teresa Shook. Mike and Teresa lived with their three young children in the town of Hamilton, 50 miles south of Missoula. Mike was a well-liked high school history teacher and Teresa was a stay-at-home mom. In December 1985, they were living in a brand new house that they had built themselves over three years. 
With the help of family and friends, they had built from scratch a simple three bedroom, one bathroom house on a beautiful wooded piece of property overlooking the mountains. The main living area was an open beam living room with a writing and sewing loft above. The young family had moved in just before Thanksgiving and they were now enjoying their very first Christmas season in their new home. Of course, with a new home, the Shook family also needed new furniture. And that furniture had come from Conlon's. In August of that year, Mike and Teresa had visited Conlon's furniture store and they had bought a living room couch set from a saleswoman named Joyce. Joyce had assured the couple that the furniture could be held until November and delivered then when their house was ready. It was Wayne Nance who delivered the furniture along with a coworker named Mike. Teresa had been home alone when the furniture had arrived and she had been ecstatic to see it. To Conlin's worker Mike, it was an uneventful delivery, but for Wayne Nance, it was not because he would return. On the evening of December 12, 1985, the Shook family was enjoying a quiet night at home. Their oldest son, Matt, age seven, was already in bed asleep. Luke, age four, and Megan, age two and a half, were awake and playing while Teresa was baking Christmas cookies in the kitchen. She planned to use the cookies as decorations on their new Christmas tree. And Mike, sat on the new living room furniture and watched TV relaxing. Suddenly, there was a knock at the door and four-year-old Luke ran to answer it. The exact events of the next couple of hours are unknown, but investigators would later piece together the following. Wayne Nance had entered the house when young Luke had opened the door, announcing that he was Conan the Barbarian and that he had come only to steal some money. He had a gun and a knife. No one would know if Teresa had recognized Wayne as the person who had delivered their furniture just weeks ago. There had been an altercation during which Teresa had been shot in the ankle, and Mike had also grabbed a brass candle holder to defend his family. Sometime during the scuffle, the phone rang and Teresa answered it having a strained one minute phone call conversation with a friend who planned to have her son dropped off at the Shook household tomorrow morning. That friend had no idea what was actually going on in the Shook household at the time. Wayne was a strong man, so he was ultimately able to overpower Mike, clubbing him over the head with the brass candle holder and tying his arms and legs. Mike was then fatally stabbed in the chest and he bled to death on the living room floor. Luke was put in his bedroom along with his sleeping brother, and Megan was put in her crib, which was placed next to Mike and Teresa's bed. Their mother, Teresa, was then tied to her bed. The next day, she would be found lying on her bed with a pillow over her face. Her pants had been quickly pulled up. Her bra and underwear were strewn across the room, having been cut off her body. A towel had been placed on her bleeding ankle. She had been sexually assaulted and she had died from a fatal stab wound to her chest. Investigators would later discover that the killer had also attempted to retrieve the bullet from Teresa's ankle, but was unable to do so. It would be reported to be a 22 caliber slug embedded deep into her ankle bone. After the attack, Wayne set about preparing the house to be burned. Four-year-old Luke had come out of his bedroom and he witnessed Wayne moving furniture around and stuffing newspaper here and there and then lighting the paper. Luke had scampered back to his bedroom. When he left, Wayne had shut the front door, assuming that the fire would start and would consume all that was inside. However, that was not to be. Without the air, the fire never fully caught on, although it did smolder and it produced a poisonous lethal gas, which caused all three children to fall unconscious, laying inside the home and trapped until a friend had come to drop off his son early the next morning at 8 a.m. 
When that friend found the door open to the Shook house and walked in, he saw what had happened and he was able to carry the three unconscious children outside where they were rescued and taken by ambulance to be treated for the lethal gas poisoning. All three children would survive and recover. No one would connect Wayne to the crime until the following year. No one noticed that Wayne did not go to work the following day. No one had remembered to check on the furniture deliveries that the Shook family had received in the weeks leading to the murder, although they had talked to the construction workers who had been working in the house as well. No one realized that the Shook delivery receipt had disappeared from the Conlin's warehouse. No one was able to get information from four-year-old Luke, who was the only person left alive that night who could give details about the killer. And no one thought twice when Wayne Nance brought in two items to Conlin's to show off to his co-workers. One was a small, one-of-a-kind, hand-cast elk statue, which he would later give to his father for Christmas 12 days later, and two, a custom-made hunting knife in a leather sheath. 1986 was a new year for Wayne, and he had a new obsession. The sales manager at Collins was a petite and pretty woman with a blonde pixie haircut and a bright smile. Her name was Chris Wells, and Wayne had had a crush on Chris Wells for a long time. Chris was married to her longtime sweetheart and husband, Doug Wells, and after a series of moves, they had finally landed in Missoula, Montana, where Doug had started a gunsmith business called Lock, Stock, and Barrel. Doug was a quiet and strong man and a football player. Chris, a graduate of the University of Iowa, where she had earned a degree in interior design, had landed a position that she loved, working as a sales manager at Collins Furniture Store. Chris and Doug were a happy couple who enjoyed their life in Missoula and had many friends with whom they socialized. One time they had brought a couple of those friends to the cabin, the bar where Wayne was a part-time bouncer. Wayne couldn't believe his luck when Chris had walked in. The following day, Wayne had given Chris a small watercolor drawing of a scantily clad woman. It was a very inappropriate gesture for a worker to be giving to his boss at work. That wasn't the only inappropriate act of Wayne's, however. It wouldn't be discovered until later, but Wayne had compiled a whole album of Polaroid snapshots of Chris, all carefully cropped and labeled. He kept scraps of paper where she had signed her initials and a photo of Chris in his wallet as well, and he constantly showered her with little trinkets and gifts. Chris felt uncomfortable with all of Wayne's obsessive attention, and she made it known to him that she did not like it. She threw away his gifts and his trinkets, and when Wayne had discovered that fact, that she had thrown away his gifts, he presented her with a small turtle paperweight on her 33rd birthday on August 10th, 1986, along with a card that read, quote, since you didn't seem to enjoy the jewelry that I gave you, maybe you'll appreciate a piece of artwork. I may be slow and cold-blooded, but only time will tell. Was Wayne talking about the turtle paperweight or himself? 23 days later, Wayne Nance was in a foul mood at work. He complained to a co-worker in the warehouse that he just wasn't appreciated. There was a simmering rage bubbling just below the surface of Wayne, and he was ready to blow. It was the night of September 2nd, 1986, and Doug and Chris Wells had arrived home after a night out with friends. Doug was in the basement cleaning his rifles, and Chris was already upstairs in bed reading a magazine. And as Doug went to prepare for bed, he remembered that it was trash night and he needed to put out the garbage for pickup the next morning. He entered the garage and when he opened the garage door, he was met with a surprising sight. He had seen a man crouching outside along the house and it was Wayne Nance. 
Doug recognized Wayne right away. He had known him from the furniture store. Wayne said he had just been going by their house and he had seen something suspicious outside. And he had told Doug to go get a flashlight so that they could investigate. Not thinking clearly, Doug had turned to go back in the house to retrieve the flashlight like Wayne had asked, when all of a sudden he felt a hard hit to the back of his head and he fell. He and Wayne began a struggle. Hearing the fight, Chris ran into the room and Wayne drew his gun, pointing it at the couple. Chris was shocked and confused and asked Wayne why he was there. Wayne replied that he had done something bad and he just needed some money to get out of town. He promised he wasn't going to hurt them and that he just needed money. Chris knew Wayne, so she didn't have a reason not to believe him. So upon Wayne's instructions, Chris tied up Doug with rope that Wayne had brought with him. And then next, Chris was tied up by Wayne. Chris told Wayne where there was cash in the house and for him to go get it, which he proceeded to do. But oddly, after he got the cash, he still wasn't leaving. He was just getting more and more amped up, telling Chris and Doug that he was afraid that the couple would be able to untie themselves too easily after he had left, he moved Chris to her bedroom. On the bed in the bedroom, Wayne tied Chris's hands to the bed frame and tied her feet together as well. He put one of Doug's socks in her mouth and tied pantyhose around her head to secure it. The time was around 12.30 a.m. Meanwhile, in the living room, Doug was losing blood from the wound on his head and he was weak. Trying to keep Wayne appeased though, he allowed himself to be led into the basement by Wayne, where he was tied to a column in the basement. Wayne hit him hard three more times on the back of his head and then he left to check on Chris, still in the bedroom. Wayne had not noticed the rifles that Doug had been cleaning earlier on the gun bench. Chris had been in the bedroom trying to get her hands and feet free. She was almost there. She planned to escape to get help. What she had forgotten was the handgun that Doug had stashed in the nightstand. For the next several minutes, Wayne continued to run back and forth between his two captives, between the bedroom and the basement, continually checking on their restraints and talking to himself. He was becoming more and more frenzied as well. It was time. It was time for Wayne to attack. Wayne confronts Doug one last time and abruptly stabs Doug in the chest, sinking the knife underneath his heart, severing his diaphragm. Doug is unable to make a sound and he sinks to the basement floor, watching as Wayne pulled the knife out of his own body and wiping the blade clean on Doug's pants. Doug is filled with a blinding white rage. He remembered he wasn't dead yet. Leaving Doug bleeding on the basement floor, Wayne returns to Chris, the woman that he had been obsessing over and stalking for years. It was the moment he had been waiting for for a long time. But it was not going to go as Wayne had planned. Amazingly, Doug had been able to muster enough strength to wriggle free of the ropes and load one cartridge in that nearby rifle, setting himself solid at the bottom of the basement stairs, waiting for Wayne to return. Doug knew he didn't have much strength left. When Wayne appeared again at the top of the basement stairs, he could not have anticipated Doug Wells taking straight aim at him with a rifle. Doug fired, but Wayne was able to run back to the bedroom. Bleeding profusely, Doug followed Wayne into the bedroom. Wayne had been hurt with the shot, and with the butt of the rifle, Doug began to beat Wayne, but Wayne just wouldn't go down. Wayne was very strong. Wayne was able to reach for his own gun, taking a shot at Doug, but missing, the bullet landing in the wall across the room. During this fight, the bedside lamp shattered leaving the room in total darkness. Doug managed to leap over the bed, grabbing the handgun from the nightstand and aiming in the darkness toward the direction of Wayne. And he just shot. And flipping on the overhead light, it was confirmed. Wayne Nance was dead. Both Chris and Doug Wells survived. And because of their heroic survival, 
a serial killer was discovered. After the death of Wayne Nance and the city of Missoula learned of the shocking attack by the worker from Conlin's furniture store, Mike Shook's father, Bob, made an immediate connection. Mike and Teresa had bought furniture from Conlin's furniture store in the month leading up to their death. He called the police, asking them to be on the lookout for two special items that had been discovered to be missing from Mike and Teresa's home. Number one, the hand-cast, one-of-a-kind elk statue that Wayne had given to his father as a Christmas present had actually been a special gift to Mike Shook from his sister-in-law. And number two, the custom-made hunting knife in the leather sheath. That had been a gift from Bob to his son, Mike Shook. Both items would later be found in Wayne's bedroom. The killer of Mike and Teresa Shook was now known. It was Wayne Nance. Ultimately, it was determined by investigators that Wayne Nance had murdered at least four people. Donna Pounds, Marcy Bachman, who Wayne had known as Robin, the drifter, and Mike and Teresa Shook. He had also attempted to murder two more people, Chris and Doug Wells. But investigators suspect Wayne in at least two more deaths and perhaps more. In 1980, the body of a 15-year-old girl was found tossed down the embankment of a highway near Wayne's home. She was a runaway from Seattle, Washington, and later identified as Devonna Nelson. Wayne is suspected in her death as well. And in 1985, another body was found in the woods of Missoula, Montana. She was found within three miles of the location of Devonna Nelson's body and the burial site of Robin. Nicknamed Christy Crystal Creek, she had been tossed naked from the top of the mountain down into a dried up rocky creek bed one year earlier in 1984. And she remained unidentified until May 2021, when through DNA extraction and genealogy research, she was discovered to be Janet Lee Lucas, and she was 23 years old when she died. Janet grew up in California and Washington State, and it is unknown when or why she came to Missoula, Montana. Janet left behind a five-year-old son when she had went missing, and that son had never stopped searching for his mother. Janet had been shot twice in the head, just like Wayne's victim Robin had been. Investigators are almost certain that both women were killed by the same person, but that may never be known for certain. Because in his death, by the hands of the heroes Chris and Doug Wells, the serial killer Wayne Nance took many secrets to his grave. Thank you for your time in watching this video. I know your time is valuable and I'm so glad that you chose to spend it listening to this story. If you enjoyed it, I would appreciate it if you leave a like, and if you would like to hear more true crime stories, please consider subscribing. It has been my honor telling the story of the many victims of this horrible killer, and may their memory be a blessing to all who loved and cared for them. Until next time, please take care. Bye. Mm -hmm.